everything gets a bit more complicated if we look at omnidirectional um, 4G, sub 6 gigahertz, sub 3 gigahertz, UEs now, easy measurements over the air, um, equivalent isotropic radiated power or sensitivity, and now we get something like this. I mean, we not only have to measure the narrow beams, and we don't only have to measure them statically, but also the beam steering capability, the dynamic behavior of them. And then we also have to check for side lobes, and we have to check for the nulls, because that's probably even more important that we don't waste the energy there where we don't want it. And then the next step is, when we, it was, um, one of the gentlemen at the podium just said that there will still be some connected measurements. But how do we get these measurements, EVM, ACLR, spurious emissions, something like this, in an over-the-air fashion? So this is coming as well, because at a certain level, we won't be able to, um, to connect them to our device under test. Yeah, this is just one of our simulations. It's, it's again, we're not only talking about centimeter and millimeter waves. At 2.69 gigahertz in that case, just an eight element radiator we can see here, dimensions of 0.5 meter. And if we look at the classic formulas, our uh, far field uh, distance at 4.1 meter and uh, the reactive near field here below 0.6 meters, just important to see. Here we need to take into account phase and magnitude, whereas in the far field it's just the magnitude that's coming. This is the real behavior we want to find out. But how can we do this in a tight and uh, measurement setup? And obviously one, one way to go is the near field to far field transformation. Um, this is a method that's based on our uh, spiral scanner. So you see a parallel movement of the device under test in this case. It's a reference antenna and our measurement antenna, which is dual polarized. And then we do a, a combined measurement, which you can see here. So it's a bit like uh, peeling an apple or peeling an orange. That movement, and if you look at the classical approaches of moving, measuring, moving, measuring, moving, measurements, uh, measuring, we got uh, tremendous um, uh, time savings uh, for this capability. And this is all based on a near field to far field algorithm we're using in cooperation with a technical university in Munich um, called FIAFTA, Fast Irregular Antenna Field Transformation Algorithm, which allows this irregular grids and the irregular measurement points rather than this very regular and this allows the um, saving in time. So that's that's the foundation, our near field to far field transformation. And then the, oh sorry, the question is do we really need it? Are we not already in the far field? And uh, we had this measurement set up just with a base station that was uh, one meter twenty two long. We did this in China at the beginning of last year. This was the pattern we received when we um, measured in the near field and we illustrated that pattern and then we did the near field to far field transformation and all of a sudden we get this pattern you see a uh, beam steering at zero degrees we laid it flat on the table and uh, it was radiating upwards so this is um, actually absolutely in line with what, with what was measured for this device under test in a different setup and shows the necessity to do the near field to far field transformation depending on frequency and size of the device and then the next question is always but does it really work? Is it good enough? Is it accurate enough? And this is what this chart is about. It was actually the uh, antenna, the test antenna you saw in the video. So we've got two graphs, which is the measurement with our system, and we use the exact same serial number of device and measured that in a different lab in Spain at the Polytechnic Madrid. And we got the similar results. So what's probably easier to see is that difference curve here, which is at below 1 dB. And that was a measurement setup, our um, installation in Poland, and the one in Madrid with different measurement equipment, different software, and different near field to far field transformation. But the same device on the test, and you can see how closely these results align for the E field and the, uh, for the E plane and H plane. Here, the example frequency was 4.9 gigahertz. And then, now I haven't talked about near field to far field transformation, it's always the same discussion we have. Are we really in the far field already? Are we still in the near field? What can we do to keep the footprint small? How can we keep test time down? And I mean, the classical approach is always far field is the maximum of 2D squared over lambda. So we've got the size of our antenna array, or 10D or 10 lambda. So that's easy to calculate, but you will get it to pretty big distances. The question is, that's on the safe side, where are we really if we do some measurements? And uh, there's uh, two things I'd like to say at this point. So when we look at the minimum beam width or the angle between nulls and the wavelength, we can 
come to a different result of the distance we need, which is 2 lambda over alpha min, this minimum angle squared. And this is applicable for the UT size, uh, much bigger than the wavelength, and the antenna size. And I think this is, once we're moving up into millimeter or centimeter wave, that is a given, but it's only under these uh, conditions. And we also thought about the idea, and we did some measurements for that. You can see here three lines on this one. This would be the ideal behavior um, power here um, versus distance of the device under test towards the test antenna. That's on the x-axis and on the y-axis the power. So the ideal um, far field condition would uh, work like this. And then we have um, the, the real behavior when we're still in the near field of the, de uh, the device versus the test antenna, E field and H field. And there's some point of intersection here, which in the theory, that's a theoretical model here on the left. Um, is at, what do we say here, d divided by lemma at uh, 10 to the power of minus 1. So there's some point in reality when we do the measurements that is much smaller than what we have in these equations here. And we did a measurement with a, a LTE UE FTD band 3 device, so it's roughly 15 centimeters in size. <coughs> and we did these measurements, we had a fixed measurement antenna, and we moved the device on the test along <coughs> the x-axis away from the test antenna and we could see exactly this behavior. So this is the ideal behavior which we see here as well. And now you can see that intersect point here where actually that um, um, behavior of the far field is already present although we are in a much uh, smaller distance from the device of the test and the test antenna than theory would predict. So this is basically here at some 13, 14 centimeters already. And this just just to sum it up, obviously when we look at 5G antenna performance, uh, we've got quite a few um, challenges to cover. The different types of test systems, test time versus test signal. What kind do we do CW-based measurements, which still have their place? What kind of modulation do we use? Where are we in the field? I've uh, discussed that before, near or far field. How do we do faceless measurements when I don't connect an RF connector to my device on the test anymore, especially in the field of base stations? What can we do there? And, uh, how can we calibrate and verify our um, devices, especially in the production environment? And what we think is important is maybe different solutions or try to find one common solution. But what's always uh, important is that we can scale. And we've got everything from module testing, UE testing, um, base station testing, how big they become. And that's the real challenge. So, so this is.